It's my great pleasure to introduce Chris Curtis show. Chris bespoke Taylor down in Soho. How are you doing today, Chris? I'm good, thank you. I'm very well. Chris, thanks for joining us. For the uninitiated, please give us a thumbnail sketch of you. Uh, so we're a small bespoke tailors in Berwick Street in Soho. Um, we uh, accommodate a lot of film and TV. Um, we are quite good at uh, sort of different periods from sort of 1850 onwards. Um, hence, we've, uh, you know, over the years we have picked up a lot of knowledge and we've got a lot of literature and books and things about old cutting and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and we're not afraid to try such <laughs> things. You know, some people don't want to stray away from their house style and uh, do something a little bit different. But uh, I'm always willing to try something new or a different period or something that's a little bit out there. So. Awesome. Well, Chris, I know Matt's got uh, 101 questions about your involvement with the James Bond franchise, but just before yeah. we get to that, um, I'm curious to know, before Chris Kerr, there was Mr. Reddy, who is your dad. Right. Um, yes. Could you just talk about your, your dad, please, and the transition, yeah. how it came from him to you? Sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, my dad has... Uh, it's so he, he left school at 15 years old, as you did back in the early 50s, I'm going to say. <laughs> Um, and was given three options, as he says, uh, when he left school, there wasn't exams or anything like that. He was just given three options of what do you want to do? Do you want to be a cabinet maker? Do you want to be a builder? Do you want to be a tailor? And he chose tailoring. So, uh, obviously he's from, uh, the East End of London and started work in a factory, which East End had many factories back then, um, creating you know, all sorts of things. Um, so he started work in a factory, uh, cutting out clothes, just on blocks, uh, and decided that he, you know, he liked it. Uh, he wanted to make his way to Savile Row, as everybody, you know, it's it's where you were supposed to go if he was going to become a bespoke tailor. So he he jumped from a few shops here, there, and there. I mean, there was many many tailors in London back then. Um, the world of ready to wear didn't exist, did it? So um, there was a tailor on almost every street. Um, so he thought he'd make his way to Savile Row. Didn't quite get there. Got as far as Soho. Worked for a couple of people in Soho and never made the final sort of 500 metre jump to get there. Um, and then whilst working in one of the shops in uh, on Brewer Street, the name escapes me right at the moment. Um, he met up with a couple of guys that worked at another shop uh, called Sam Arcus, which was on Berwick Street. Uh, I don't know whether there was any kind of uh, falling out or whether there was just a general, they were just getting older and decided that they wanted to run their own business, but they decided to open a shop right opposite Sam Marcus. Um, and there was three partners. Uh, in the business and my dad was going to be the cutter uh, there was one guy that was the business owner that kind of did a little bit of everything and then there was one guy that was just a salesman so there was three partners to begin with and um, so the the business owner if you like originally was called Len Wilton so they opened their own shop called Len Wilton's um, in 62 and that was at number 52 Berwick Street uh, right opposite Sam Marcus who had been there since the 30s sort of thing um, and uh, apparently back then there was seven tailor shops on Berwick Street Wow! Um, which yeah is quite a lot I mean as I say there was a lot of tailor shops in London back then but seven on one street was quite unusual yeah. uh, you know there was only Savile Row that really had anything like that kind of uh, concentration of one business in one area so um, but Soho was always known for a lot of people that worked for the big shops on Savile Row would have upstairs rooms where they would work. You know, a lot of the workforce was in Soho anyway. Um, so it was, it was kind of seemed like a natural position to be in for right. them. And, uh, sorry, Kevin. So, so the, the partners slowly disappeared one by one, went off and did different things and come sort of, mid 70s i think uh my dad was kind of left on his own 
uh, with the business and carried on as Mr. Eddie. And when did that transition to Chris Kerr? So that then happened in, oh, I started work with my dad in 1997. Wow, okay. Uh, I was originally, I left school at 16 and I got an apprenticeship in the print industry. Um, so I did a, I can't remember how many years, five years maybe? Five year apprenticeship. Um, back then I was doing what was called page planning and photo retouching um, before Apple Macs. Work <laughs> alive and made. Um, we work on you know proper purpose built computer systems that would retouch photos and things like that. And it was quite a, an in depth kind of job, it wasn't just press this button and this right. function happens, it was, it was, there was a lot more to it than that. Um, you know, we'd spend all day just retouching one photo for a magazine cover. Huh. Um, rather than just, you know, something that you could do on your home computer now quite easily. Mm. Um, so I was doing that for quite a few years, uh, but obviously Apple did come along with uh, Photoshop and suddenly made a reasonably skilled job, really well paid skilled job into something that your average 15 year old could do in their bedroom. Wow. That's me. <laughs> I wasn't going to throw you under the bus, Matt. That, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's me. Basically... I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Chris. <laughs> that's no problem. Uh, but it gave me the impetus to get up and go and do something else. And I tell you what happened. What I used to when I was in the print. I used to look after uh, the Telegraph Sunday magazine, um, and I remember doing. There was a double page spread. And it was about all the young tailors on up and coming tailors on Savile Row. And there was a big picture of them at the end of Savile Row all together. So there was like back then there was like Oswald Boateng and there was Timothy Everest and Richard Anderson. And there was all these people all lined up and these were all going to be the new faces of tailoring. And it just sort of made me think, yeah, do you know what? I've always been interested in what my dad does. Um, that, that old fashioned dying trade that, mm. uh, well, as they said it was back then, has suddenly got all these young guys working in it and all these new ideas and all these new people that keep coming in. And I just, I just thought, yeah, do you know what? I really wouldn't mind doing that. It would be a really cool thing to do. And, you know, because I knew my dad did a lot of TV and a lot of film and things, and he was very blasé about it. And half the time he didn't even know who he was making for. It didn't really mean a lot to him. It was just another job. Yeah. Um, I remember one day he came home and, uh, you know, I was a young teenager and he said, oh, we had a bunch of sort of quite scruffy Irish guys in today. Um, I think they're in a band. And me and my brothers are sort of questioning him. It turns out it was you too. <laughs> brilliant <laughs> so we then of course gave him a bag of all our records and cds and said get that not signed then please thank you very much <laughs> nice. uh, but nice. that was typical of him really he didn't really know who you two was it wasn't his generation he just and he wasn't even that interested really that he was just you know happy to do the job knew that there was some kind of band that was good enough for him um well, there's so, nothing like client confidentiality if you don't even know who your client is, right? So. Exactly. How about that? Perfect. Exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, so fast forward a few more years and I'm in the print and feeling a bit despondent that my job looks like it's going to disappear. So I had a conversation with him and said, look, I fancy coming into tailoring. And he was like at first mortified. Um, <laughs> well, as I said, it was supposed to be a dying trade. It was supposed to be a dying trade for the last twenty years that he was doing it, and he wasn't all that keen to begin with. But he, you know, he spoke to a few people around the trade and said, "What do you think? Would it be a good idea?" And everyone seemed to think that it was. So, mm. yeah, lo and behold, nineteen ninety-seven, I left my job. Well, um, that's it. That's the history. That was it. Started working with my dad. Well, fast. Is, is, oh, sorry. So wait, wait, is your dad the one who trained you? Yes. So I trained with my father. I did do a couple of courses at London College of Fashion. Um, to me personally, I don't think I really learned much there. There was a lot about the business of being in fashion. Um, there wasn't so much as the practical 
element that I needed if I was going to become basically like my father, a cutter and a, you know, a tailoring, you know, an owner of a tailoring business. Um, so yeah, I basically learned standing next to my dad. And were you surprised at how hard a skill it is? Because like you, I, I did do London fashion school. Um, there oh, wasn't yeah. a whole lot of cutting, but whatever cutting was going on was just incredibly difficult. I mean, it, yeah. it, it's surprising how, I think people have this great idea of becoming designers. And then once they realize how hard it is to put anything together in terms of garments, they soon lose the optimism. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that is the thing I found rather frustrating coming from a background of the sort of computer side of things and everything was as it should be and this equals this and that would do this and this does this and then I went into this archaic world of well this is this blink plus a sixth and a quarter of an inch and so well why that was my main thing why I kept saying that a lot to him and a lot of the time he's like I don't really know it just is you know, and there was a there was a fair amount of freehand drawing that he used to do, and he would draft patterns as well. So I would be going, "So why have you done that?" There, he said, "Well, it just looks right." Right. So you kind of had to. There was there there is a lot of mathematical things to work out to draft a pattern, and that is fine. But then there is, you know, everybody then has their own take on it, um, mm. and there was a lot of well, that's that plus a quarter of an inch, and that's that lesser quarter of a year and, and you just had to kind of fill your way and learn your own or oh, that looks right so yeah no it's, uh, it's a lot harder that than it looks a bit frustrating uh, but, well i guess that's how house styles come about i mean everyone has that kind oh, of yes. independent look they put their own take on it and you know whatever happens out of that freestyling is pretty much what identifies and characterizes a house style right? absolutely yeah no that's that's completely right i mean you know, and then within our business, you would have X amount of people working for us, let's say four or five coat makers, three, four trouser makers, a couple of waistcoat makers, everybody would do their own part of the suit. And you could almost give a different coat maker the same thing that you have cut. And it would come back just slightly different. Not very different, but you know, the same job, same specifications, just all feeling slightly different. Yeah. It, it, it takes quite an eye it, take, it takes quite an eye to notice that difference doesn't it oh yeah of course yeah <laughs> most people wouldn't generally notice um but uh it's it, you know that's that is the that's the world of handcraft tailoring really matt you, you had a question on the list about uh, chris did you make anything for pierce or for daniel craig either in the other films they've starred in or in the bond franchise uh i have actually i made uh, a couple of suits and an overcoat for Pierce for they film now. I'm going to try and remember the name of it. Oh my god! <laughs> is it uh, Lessons in Love or the or the only way is no, down or it, something? Is it the only way is down? Was that where there was on the top of the building? Someone was going to jump off and that's yeah, the one. Yeah, that's the one. Yes, I believe we made yeah. we made we made them a couple of suits and an overcoat for that. Mm. Uh, and I did, yeah, again, I remember going to a hotel to give him fittings. He was staying in this rather nice, very, very boutique -y, quaint hotel, sort of out the back of Harrods Way, somewhere like where all those embassies are. It's like in one of those very nice Georgian houses. Um, nice. So yeah, that was a good memory. But yeah, going around to studios or hotels to fit and measure actors is kind of, yeah, that's pretty much my day-to-day -day sort of thing that I'm up to, so. Have you, dealt, have you dealt anything for Daniel Craig? Yes. Uh, there was a need for some extra versions of his first suit from Casino Royale for a Sony TV advert. Ah. Oh, that's um, interesting and they wanted to have him walking towards the camera with explosions going off and oh, i remember that, that one yeah. so they needed to have x amount of suits to then break down into from pristine to completely wrecked. i love that advert i fucking yes. love that advert that is brilliant i remember that so well it's kind of like in this wind tunnel and then he has yeah. like these ricochets you know he's just getting thrown about all over oh, the place yeah. and the suit yeah. just gradually deteriorates 
That yes, is yes. one of the best promo adverts for James Bond, mm. I, I think, out there. Yeah. So, yes, we did make some for that. Um, there was obviously a lot of to and fro uh, with uh, lawyers and Tom Ford and whatever about how and where. Because and, obviously, he was clearly, he was supposed to be wearing a Tom Ford suit. Um, but This must have been for Quantum then. Yeah, I think it yeah, was. I think. I think it was about them, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, I think with the dog. Bear with me a sec, Matt. Take the yeah. Sorry. Sure thing. So I haven't really got any private work coming through the shop, and haven't for months now. Um, but film has kept me busy. Um, the film That's industry cool. in the UK at the moment is sort of booming, really. There, there's so much work out there. There's so much that's needed to be done. Um, there any any film in particular, Chris? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a reasonable amount for the next Mission Impossible. Oh, um, terrific. I'm doing a British TV called Peaky Blinders. They're in their last season. Oh, yeah. So oh, doing, fantastic. Things for that. I'm not the only tailor that works on that. There's about four or five different tailors that work on that. Right. Um, but kind of share the characters. I'm looking at my list. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the previous podcast that I did with the costume designer for Mission Impossible, and her names just escaped me. Jill Taylor. For Match Point, Jill Taylor. You're right. Sorry, you are yes. right. That's um, it. Yeah, yep. she was on the. I I thought you said what Taylor? Sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what I heard as well. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunate okay. coincidence of names, but yeah. So she, I mean, she was on the show just a couple of weeks ago. She was a real delight. Okay, great. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah so I've been doing a, a fair amount of that. Um, uh, I've been doing some ladies stuff for that as well. For couple of the lady act for the uh, female actors, um, which is a bit different, a bit of a change. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's that's all going on. I've got some work for Downton Abbey. They're going to start doing a new film soon as well. So Interesting. Um, yeah. So there's lots of other, and yes, various other things that are going on. So just looking at my list. <laughs> so um well, chris i wanted to ask is, is there a difference in making suits for film versus you know tailoring a, a an independent customer no not at all we don't we don't approach it in any different way at all um it's still done the same way it's still done properly um that's a question that many a designer will ask uh maybe for stunt situations and things like that is well you don't really have to make this properly if you can get away with doing it in another way and realistically it's, sometimes it's probably harder to try not to do it the way that we do things um so every suit is made properly right uh, even the stunt ones so albeit sometimes with stunts they're bigger to accommodate for you know harnesses and backpacks you know protective clothing and maybe a few stretchy panels here and there so fights can uh, happen and things like that oh i bet the mission impossible suits are, are quite complicated in that in that way then <laughs> that, but generally they do it with multiples of the same mm. thing so you've just got a lot of lots of trousers and lots of things so if something breaks it's just change them do it again <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I know I might be going off the grass here with this question, but how does it work with films in terms of can you advertise like on your site, for example, Tom Cruise wearing Chris Kerr in the new up and coming film? I mean, are you able to align yourself with things like that or do you have to be quite coy and understated? No, I have to be very coy and very under, understated with all of that. Right. Um, it's, that's why there probably isn't so much out there. Um, I'd love to shout about a lot of things that we've done, but you know, you do sign NDAs and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sometimes they are not keen for that association, you know? And so that's fine. I do the job and that's, that's, that's what you sign up for. So generally I've found that most designers are quite happy for you to put images out there, maybe on Instagram or something after the event after something's been released it's been seen by the general public um, you're not revealing anything that's not 
you know, it's original content that's not been seen yet. Um, most people are, are, are reasonably happy for that to happen. I haven't had anyone come to me yet and say, oh, do you know what? Could you take that picture off your Instagram or we're going to sue you? That hasn't happened yet. But having said that, I often don't really, I don't put a lot on there. Um, I've, I've noticed that you, um, I do follow your Instagram quite keenly, but it's, yeah. it, it's not the most populated or the most like day to day no. runnings. Um, and no. it is often resharing other costume designers like Arion Phillips might post something and you'll reshare that. From the, from yes. The Churchill, exactly. For example. So, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, at the end of the day, I want to work with these people. I don't want to be the guy that takes something that they've done and go, Hey, look what I've done. Look what I've made. And yeah. Before the thing's seen, because you can get yourself into a lot of trouble in that manner, and that's not the business that I want to be in. Thank you. Um, the other thing, you know, Instagram and all that is a, a lovely thing and it's a lovely tool, but uh, sometimes, in all honesty, I'm just busy doing the, the work. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I'd much rather that. <laughs> exactly. I'm just busy doing the work. I had this very same conversation with a shirt maker the other day. Um, that I was in a sharing a car with to go to another film job, and um, and she said the same thing: is that her Instagram isn't very well populated, but it's because we're just damn busy. <laughs> right, that's you'd much rather it that way, though, right? Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> rather than using Instagram to try and leverage business and try. Yeah, and, exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, and I follow a lot of other tailors. Um, it's a very small community. We all know each other. Um, you know, generally pretty much everybody gets on. We're always quite a friendly bunch. Um, yeah, but yeah, there's people on there that will post two times a day regularly every day. And mm. I just think, my God, how much time have you got in your hands? Yeah. Yeah. I, you <laughs> know, I, I, yeah. Cause I'm, I'm always seeing like, I, yeah, I, I see Stephen Hitchcock. He, he posts so much. Yeah. He posts amazing things, uh, but yeah. he's, he's, he's always posting and does a yeah. wonderful job at that. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They really do, um, but I just, I literally just don't have the time. I'm always, yeah. thinking, you know, I mean, right at this moment, I'm looking at my list on the wall there, yeah. and I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I've got 12 different productions I'm working on at the moment. Oh, wow. fantastic. Uh, you know, some big, some small, but at the end of the day, they're all, they're all, it's all work and it all needs to get done. So, um, well. Chris, I want to be respectful of your time as you've got a big list in front of you. Um, yeah, I'm also fun. running out of my time on my free Zoom call. <laughs> Do you have any other further questions? Um, no, I think, uh, I think you covered it. Uh, but th thank you very much for speaking with us, taking your time. Okay, no problem. I hope, it's, yeah. uh, I hope it's been useful and I hope it's come across okay. Oh, mate, I, could uh, have, I could have you on all day. I hope you come back on, um, maybe talk about yeah, some of the films once they're done. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I'm sorry for keep sort of just going, do you know what? I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. I know, what you mean. I know, know what you mean. It's, it's mm -hmm. a juggle between, you know, I live 40 miles away as well. So I'm sort of oh, traveling right. a lot. Um, I mean, you know, I live out in the countryside, which is great. Love working in Soho, love being in Soho. Couldn't do my job anywhere else, but I also do love to get away from it and yeah. see some hills and trees and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so I'm either at work or travelling to or from work, so it's it's been a bit tricky, but uh, nice. It's been good to be on. Thank you for coming on. Uh, just lastly, Thank I had a, a side compliment from Verity Hawks, who we had on talking about Snatch the other day, and okay, she, said, yeah. she said your dad was fantastic because he understood, and, and you as well, understood the theatrics of turning around things really quick. So doing the yeah. Jimmy Jones suit and stuff like that. So, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, that's that's a big part of the film world. Is a lot of tailors would uh, absolutely it would blow their mind to think that they need to do x amount in one week you know yeah. i think they could all do it i just think they don't want to do it. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's, it yeah it's definitely got to be you've got to have the right mindset to kind of work with these people in this environment um that's yeah that's how it is that's how, we, how we do the work we do well I, I tried to get hold of Vinnie Jones as well um yes if he wanted to talk about because you know he's obviously into style he's done the guy Ritchie yeah. films and whatnot um yeah. I got through to his agent and she said how much do you want to pay Vinnie to come on the show right. <laughs> which is a perfectly valid question but I did say look I'm sorry this isn't uh a sp yeah. this isn't anything sponsored no one makes money on this show far from no, it exactly. <laughs> but, he was the guy that kind of made my dad be called Mr Eddie 
Really? Oh, really? Yeah, because he 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 was one of the first that just used to start calling him Mr. Red. Oh, that's yeah. fascinating. Even before the acting, when he was uh, playing football, um, you know, he used, my dad used to make him suits, and and yeah, he he was the one that sort of started the whole Mr. Red thing. Oh, that's fascinating, Matt. I'll have to send you some clips of uh, Vinnie Jones, M- M- Mr. Red, the horse. <laughs> 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 Stephen, Mr. Red. Stephen, okay. Mr. Red. <laughs> 